This video shows you how to start up the NICR SPE microscope. First of all, turn on the wall plug numbered as 1. Wait for the microscope to boot up. And then switch on the CTR advanced box, the lamp, and laser power and turn the laser key to on position. On the touch screen, observe the objective. It is a dry 20 times lens. Press the XYZ and make sure that the red arrow is at the bottom. Let's bring the condenser back and carefully place a slide on a stage, cover slip facing down. Make sure the slide is securely in place with the slide clips. Bring down the condenser and on the touch screen move the red arrow up to zero. Press the contrast tab, fluorescence is chosen and now we select Fitzy. Open the shutter to let the light through. Then find the focal plane. To swap to oil immersion lens, turn off the shutter Choose an oil immersion objective, such as the 63. And now remove the slide by lifting the condenser. Take out your slide and add a small drop of oil to the sample. Place the slide back on a stage, upside down. Make sure it's secured. And bring down the condenser. On the touch screen, the 63 is flashing and press it again and it will come up to focus. Then switch the lamp on and find the focal plane. When finished, turn the lamp off. This video shows you how to operate the Leica SPE confocal located in the NICR. It is expected that you understand good experimental design for setting your positive and negative controls and that you understand the theory of confocal microscopy before following this, as we won't be going into any details on how the image is formed and which samples you should be using to set your dynamic range and check for non-specific signal. Ensure the system is started up as per the SOP and instruction video. The hardware must have finished booting before starting the software. This is evident when the microscope touchscreen has finished booting. Here we've finished booting the system and have added a sample using an oil immersion objective and found our focal plane using the oculars and bright field. Firstly, double click the LAS X icon on the desktop. This brings up a splash screen with options for configuration and microscope stand. These are already set, so don't adjust them, just click OK. Now wait for the system to boot. It checks connections with all the hardware and takes almost a minute. The system boots into the Acquire tab, which has three panes. The one on the right shows the current live image or selected image. The central one shows the beam path with lasers used and detection settings. The left one has two more tabs. Open Projects and Acquisition, which displays the current settings for the image. In the central pane, we can see that there are four laser lines available and one reflected light detector for fluorescence, PMT1, which has a variable bandpass filter. There is also another detector for transmission, allowing a bright field image to be captured with the laser light passing through the sample. By default, PMT1 is active and no laser lines are on. The simplest way to configure the system is to use the dye assistant. Clicking this opens another window. 
Click the dot 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 icon to open a choice of dyes. Choose the fluorophore you have stained your sample with. If you have more than one, repeat for a second line. You can stack multiple fluorophores and can easily separate four in the system, more if you're careful with your choices. The system calculates the best laser lines and capture band passes to be used based on your choices. It tells you how well the dyes are excited by the lasers and warns of any potential crosstalk that may occur if they're not well separated. Because this system has only one PMT, the images will be captured frame or stack sequentially so that it doesn't have to move the bandpass filters between every line, making imaging faster. Once you're happy with this, press apply to load the configuration. If the required lasers aren't already on, it will ask you if you wish to switch them on. Click yes to allow the software to do so. Now we can see that the 488 laser is on and defaulted to 1% power. On the left there is now a sequential scan control box showing sequences 1 and 2. Here we have Alexa 488 on sequence 1, with its respective 488 laser and green emission bandpass. Alexa 594 is on sequence 2. Clicking sequence 2 loads the parameters for capturing it, which shows the 561 nanometer laser is on at 1% power. The 488 laser is still shown, but you can see that the power is turned down to zero. The detector bandpass has also been moved to cover the emission spectrum of Alexa 594. The gain is set to 100 volts by default, which is too low for most imaging. There is also an offset on the PMT to adjust the noise discrimination, but this should normally not be required. The icon for the PMT is also coloured to match the pseudo colour that the system has chosen for the channel. Before we start capturing an image, we will review the global settings that are applied to the images. These are in the XY tab. It shows an overview at the top stating it is set to 512 by 512 pixels at a scan speed of 400 Hz and a zoom of 1.5 with an area unit of 1. These are adjustable in this tab and apply to all sequences slash channels that we have in the image. Beneath pixel format and scan speed there is an option for bidirectional and then the zoom options which can be adjusted with the slider or typing in the box. This is also available via the control dials under the monitor. Beneath the zoom are the image parameters calculated from the current objective. In this case it is a 63 times oil immersion lens and therefore the 512 by 512 scan at zoom 1.5 corresponds to an image of 116 microns and pixel sizes of 227 nanometers. We can increase the scan speed to 600 Hz with only a small increase in noise. Also, we can switch bidirectional scanning on to image on both sweeps of the Galvo mirrors, as the alignment is quite good on this system. There are options for frame averaging or accumulation, but for setting the channels up we will leave these off. Now we're ready to go live and start scanning the sample. We can see that we are still on sequence 2, so the image being captured is of the Alexa 594 channel. The image looks black using the red lookup table that we have. Clicking the LUT icon swaps to a range indicator icon. This lookup table shows a glow scale, making dimmer signal easier to view. The image still looks black, so we'll increase the PMT voltage. Around 700 to 750 volts is a good level for signal with little noise. Now some signal is visible. We can enhance the visualization of it by pulling the range indicator down. At this point, I am double checking the focal plane is correct by adjusting the fine focus backwards and forwards to ensure I am in the correct or brightest plane. Once happy with this, we can improve the signal. Since we have a reasonably high PMT gain, we can do this by increasing the excitation power. Doing this shows some pixels as blue with the range indicator LUT, suggesting they are saturated. But this is only because we have clipped the LUT range. Reset the range back to full and then continue to adjust the laser intensity to optimise the signal range captured. How much of the dynamic range you want to fill depends on the range you expect from your experiment as well as sample sensitivity to light. Here we have a good image with 5% laser power. I move the stage slightly to check there is no bleaching of the area. This would be visible by a sharp line delineating the scanned area. Finally, tweak the focus until you're happy with it. There is a Galvo Z control knob under the monitor that allows very fine control of the stage Z position. Once satisfied, stop the scan and swap to the other sequence. This is one in our case. Now repeat the procedure. You'll see that the gain is back on 100 volts for this channel and the 561 laser is off with a 488 on at 1%. Press live to start scanning. The system remembers that we had the range indicator LUT on for the live image, so there is no need to adjust that. 
and increased again first as before. Here I've gone to almost 900 volts. You can see that the noise isn't too bad. It is generally worth keeping gain below 900 if possible. As you approach 1000 volts and higher, the detector sensitivity becomes very non-linear, which means you cannot reliably compare intensities between samples in such cases. Next, I increase the laser power to provide a good range from the sample and again move Z up and down to ensure that it is in the same plane as the other channel. For this particular sample, it is all autofluorescence, so the two are the same. Once satisfied, press stop to limit how much light you're inputting to your sample. We can reset the LUT. Clicking the LUT icon once takes you to a grayscale LUT. Clicking once more, the lookup table of the current channel. In this case, it is a pseudo-coloured green. Now, if you press the start button, the system will capture an image of both channels with the current settings. If you wish to see an overlay of the channels, click the overlay icon below the channels icon on the right. Double clicking on this image will fill the image view window with the overlaid channel image. As mentioned earlier, this image is of water for us in tissue, so there is broad overlap between the red and green signal. You can also see that the image is quite pixelated. If we go back to the XY tab, now that we have the channel parameters set, we can adjust the global parameters to optimize this. Swapping to 1024 by 1024 pixels will quarter the pixel area, but they are still quite large for the numerical aperture of this objective and the wavelength being visualized. Swapping to 2048 by 2048 pixels quarters their size again, and these are well within Nyquist sampling. You can check this by using a Nyquist calculator, such as the one provided on the SVI website. Now if you press start, the images take longer to scan, but at a higher resolution for the same field size. It looks better, but using the scroll wheel we can zoom in and the shot noise from the PMT is evident, especially on the green channel where we used a higher PMT gain. We can tackle this with either the scan speed or averaging each pixel. Here we'll try averaging three times. This captures the image three times and returns the average signal per pixel. Clicking on the tab for projects on the left, we can see the images we've taken. Las X is non-destructive and will keep all images captured except live images. If we compare Series 3 with Series 2, it is evident we've improved the smoothness of the data. We can try improving further by slowing the scan speed down to allow longer integration of the PMT at each pixel and, then, and further increasing the averaging. Obviously, this is increasing the time our scan takes as well as adding more light to the sample. The software applies these settings separately to each sequential scan, so a dimmer channel can be scanned slower and with more averaging than a bright one, for example. We can decrease the scan time if we only image the area of the field we're interested in. Switching zoom in on selects a rectangle for us, and we can use this to draw the area we would like to image. The software will still keep the global XY parameters we set, so we will still get a square scan to fit the area and at the same pixel density. This means our pixel sizes are now very small, meaning we are heavily oversampling. Therefore, we can reduce the scan format. With this zoom, 1024 by 1024 works well to allow satisfying Nyquist. To visualize the whole scan area, I reset the zoom using the auto fit icon on the top right and capture a scan of this plane. If you want to capture a Z stack of the field, the software has Z on it by default, just with no parameters set. We can do this using the begin and end buttons in the Z stack tab, or by stating the thickness we wish to image. If the sample is of unknown thickness, or you don't know where you are inside it, select one of the channels to go live on, and then adjust the focus to find the lowest part. It is important you do this with the Z control that the Z stack will be taken with. By default, this is the Z Galvo drive, this is only controlled by the knob on the control panel under the monitor. Whilst live, adjust this anti-clockwise until just out of focus below your sample, then click begin. Now move back through the sample and out the other side and click end. Sometimes the range indicator LUT makes this easier to allow you to see the dimmer signal. The stack size is shown at the top. Left on system optimized, which we recommend, it calculates an overlap between the planes based on the optical settings which are principally the NA, pinhole and wavelength. 
In this case, it gives us 14 slices to cover 4.5 micrometers. Now pressing start captures both channels at each Z slice sequentially. You can watch the progress of this in the image window, and at the bottom it shows you approximately how long it has left to image. A slider on the right of the image window allows you to scroll through the stack. The image can also be rendered by clicking the 3D button. This opens a new window for the renderer. This software makes a guess at the settings for minima and maxima for each channel and shows a volume render by default. The renderer is fully interactive using the mouse buttons. The snapshot window can be saved to the current image project file or exported in various formats and resolutions. Other options such as adding a scale bar are possible. Closing the renderer brings you back to LaTeX. Any images saved from the renderer to the project can be viewed in here. LaTeX makes a project file each time you start. This is a Leica image file or LIF. It can contain multiple images. Here we have the render, the raw Z stack and the single plane images we captured before all in one LIF project. Each raw image also has all the associated metadata stored with it. If you are continuing an experiment, you can use this to reuse the imaging parameter settings. Select the image in a project, then click the apply button to load the image parameter settings for it. These settings include laser power, scan size, parameters, etc. If you already have Z stack set for an image acquisition, you can still scan a single channel plane using the capture image button. Other options available include using the stage to perform tile scan images of your sample. Clicking the tile scan icon opens the stage controls below. These are easiest to operate whilst operating LASX by popping out the stage control window. This shows the current position of the stage. If you wish to mark this field, click the left hand button to mark the position. If we zoom the stage in, you can see that the point we can see is actually the size of the field. Moving the stage controls moves the field. It is better to do this while scanning in live to find the fields or use the oculus. To make this tutorial faster, I'll switch off the Z stack by deleting the begin and end positions. For each position we can then set a field size by typing in the area we wish. Here we've defined it as 2x2 two two fields. Other options are available. For example, we can get the tile scan to cover the whole area between the marked positions. We do this by switching auto stitching on. We can also automatically merge the images, and if so, control how to overlap and how accurately. LASX performs best if the speed is reduced to about one third of the range in the advanced options. Now pressing start captures multiple images of the area. These are shown as a series with a slider beneath the image viewer. 
These are stored as a single file containing the multiple locations. After capture, since we have merged images on, it will attempt to stitch them together. Again, this is stored as a new image in the lift project. You'll see that the tile scans are stored as subfolders inside the lift. Now let's go back to acquisition. We can switch off the tile scan by deselecting the tile scan icon and look at transmission imaging. The transmitted light detector, or TLD, can be switched on in any of your channels. It performs better with the bluer lasers, so here we select sequence 1 which uses a 488 and switch on the TLD. Now if we go live, we will get two channels for sequence 1. Adjusting the gain increases the brightness of the transmitted image. Do not adjust the laser power as it will affect your fluorescent channel. For the TLD you can increase the contrast by decreasing the offset too. Once happy, use start to scan your image. You will see that TLD is only active in the first sequence. When you have finished your imaging, save the data. In Open Project, select the project and right click to choose Save As. We recommend storing your data as one LIF file per cover slip. Then you need only name the LIF project file for that cover slip and the individual files don't get too large. This system has a local D drive with month folds on it. Use one of these and create a folder with your name and save the files with suitable naming. You should also have access to your group's network storage, so you can save to these if preferred, or you can move your data afterwards. Once all data are saved, as shown at the bottom of Las X, open the laser panel and switch off all lasers used. The next time you come to image, remember that you can open the previous lift file, choose one of your images and reuse the settings via the apply button. Now close Las X using the X in the corner and wait for it to finish shutting down before you switch off the hardware. This gives you time to copy data across the network and remove your sample, ensuring you clean the microscope afterwards. Finally, shut down the PC. This video shows you how to shut down the NICR SP microscope. Press the stage control button on the touch screen and bring the objective all the way down. Lift the condenser back and carefully remove the slide. To clean the objective, Use a lens tissue to wipe the excess oil off. Then an isopropanol soaked tissue to clean the lens. And finally, wipe the alcohol residue off. Bring down the condenser. Close the incubator. And switch the light off. Shut down the PC. And then turn off the laser key, power off, switch the lamp off, 
and turn off the CTR advanced box. And finally switch off plug number one.